I'm in this ancient forest, and I think something's following us, but I'm not sure. Like, can you, can you hear that in the background? Can you hear that? No. I'm not sure. I think something's definitely following us. I can't see it though, but it's getting louder. Like, you can hear that now, right? It's definitely, it's definitely, there's definitely something here. Oh my god, okay, I need to hide. Let's see if I can get a shot. Welcome to the Fellowship of the Ring game. Ooh. Yeah, it's not Halloween anymore, is it? But you know, whatever, close enough. Obligatory, like, comment, subscribe, Patreon, social media, watch my other reviews, I stream here and on Twitch, blah, 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 blah. I've wasted enough time playing this game, so let's just get into it, shall we? The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, was developed by WXP and published by Black Label Games in 2002 for the Xbox and ported to the PS2 and PC by Surreal Software. I, uh, I played the PS2 version because that's what I had when I was young, but it turns out it's, um, it's not the best version of the game, apparently. <laughs> The Fellowship game was not based on the film series, but actually is a direct adaptation of Tolkien's books, and of course it's just a complete coincidence that they decided to make it during when the films were coming out, I'm sure. It actually was only released like a month before the Two Towers film and the EA game came out, so um, you can imagine how well it sold in comparison. After getting past the weird trippy new age looking menu, the game begins with an even weirder intro FMV. The music sounds like it's about to go into the main Lord of the Rings theme tune before spiralling off and taking us through a nice little intro summarising the backstory. Not at all inspired by the similar intro from the film, we then dropped into Bag End, where a kind of smooth-faced Frodo chats to an old weathered Gandalf about the One Ring. Uh, don't pretend you know what's written on the ring, Frodo, you're literally not even looking at it. Sam doesn't even try to hide while eavesdropping. Sam, if you're gonna come in, just come in. And Gandalf drags him into the room, but um, I wish he didn't, like, god he's ugly, look at those teeth. What is it with Lord of the Rings games and ugly people? Before setting off on a magical adventure, Frodo has some chores to complete, and we finally take control of the Hobbit, who controls reasonably okay. He can jump, throw stones, and use um, a stick. There's also a first person mode, which I'm going to tell you now, did not get a lot of use beyond this intro section. Uh, here is this icon. Do we get any points for... We don't. We also get an inventory that was kind of weirdly laid out and scrolls forever. I didn't hate it, but it wasn't the easiest to navigate later on in the game when you have more things. Bag End looks pretty nice though, and they haven't copied the film here too directly, which must be great for dealing with any copyright claims from EA and New Line Cinema, right? Frodo has to find the deed and take it to Lobelia Sackville Baggins. Not that she deserves the house, but you know, whatever. Leaving the hole in the ground, Frodo gets to have a good look around the Shire, which looks okay. The colours are a bit dull and swamp-like, but there's actually some things filling the space, unlike a certain other game I know. The buildings are quite pretty and suitably hobbity, trees are always nice to have, and mushrooms are growing all over the place and can be used to restore a small amount of health. Every now and then, Frodo bumps into grumpy residents of the Shire, who need Frodo to help with some tasks, without saying please may I add, rude. Can't you see I'm busy? Actually no, you seem to be just standing about. Oh my god, that back that chat. Some of these camera angles are bizarre, and trust me, they only get worse as the game goes on. The Shire section kind of acts like a mini RPG actually, with some random fetch quests and things. Frodo meets with Fred and George- oh <laughs> sorry, I mean uh, Merry and Pippin at the Green Dragon. God I want to go to the Green Dragon so much, like it's probably the best pub ever, right? Frodo promises to meet them by Maggot's Farm later on, and then chats with gay icon Lobelia Sackville Baggins. Yas, Queen, Slay, Honey. This is, must be Lobelia, because she looks like a Lobelia. Like only old people would be called Lobelia, right? Hello Lobelia. <laughs> he refuses to hold normal conversations conversation until the sheriff promises to protect her from the wolves that obviously don't exist Lobelia. This is the Shire. Frodo rings the warning bell to alert the sheriff. <laughs> I've rung the warning bell. What's going on? Libelia finally takes the deed to Bag End, and we complete a few tasks, like finding all these packets of herbs an old man's just left lying about. That must be very special tea. While also trying to avoid Farmer Maggot's dogs. I think this bit is meant to be some weird intro into the whole sneaking alert system, but seeing as later on in the game, I never really tried sneaking past anything, it feels kind of pointless. Anyway, heading back to collect the one ring and set off Nightfalls, and we head out of Libelia's newly acquired Bag End. <gasps> 
Oh my god, the name on the sign changed to Lobelia Sackville Baggins. That's so good. And find a black rider interrogating one of the neighbours. Not gonna lie, this section of the game is spooky. Frodo has to avoid the black riders and escape Hobbiton, which is actually kind of harder than it sounds. In fact, while I was trying to read the instructions, a black rider caught me and we lost the ring. Great, thanks. Um, that's not fair, we just started. Oh, and uh, I also found out you have to start the game all over again. What? Hello? And obviously I didn't save yet, so um, uh, thanks for that game. What is this? Getting back to the game, Frodo takes his film counterpart's advice to- Get off the road! The Black Riders basically walk along the path, starting off if they hear a sound, and if they spot you properly, it's game over, baby. They're surrounded by this cool black glow and horribly menacing. Like, I found this bit absolutely terrifying when I was young. You can sneak up and around the hills and houses to avoid the main path and throwing rocks can distract them for a short time. Sometimes when they catch you, it seems a bit unfair, but actually this bit is a pretty good challenge and quite fun, if also very stressful. A map would be kind of useful though, as I definitely got lost trying to find the way out. Further on, Frodo comes across wolves. Oh, wow, I can't believe Lobelia was actually right. And I thought it would be a good time to test out this fancy new ring we've got. Wearing the one ring makes you invisible and allows you to simply walk past enemies without being attacked, but wearing it for too long will cause Frodo to start losing health. Also, over over time, the ring decreases Frodo's purity, meaning in the future the ring can be worn for progressively less and less time before causing damage. A kind of cool feature, but also something that kind of made me not want to wear the ring, and indeed I barely used it throughout the game, only when I basically couldn't be bothered to fight enemies. Speaking of fighting, the combat in this game is a bit, uh, meh? It's by no means awful, but I wouldn't exactly call it good or complex. As Frodo, you can basically only hit enemies with your stick, great, and while you can block, enemies are still able to cause damage, which kinda sucks. The game is also lacking a lock-on feature, which honestly would have made the fighting so much better. It can be pretty easy to get overwhelmed by multiple enemies, and no offence, but Frodo's rocks couldn't even take down a bird, so I'm pretty sure they're going to be useless in battle too. Eventually making it to Maggoty Farmer Maggot's farm, the hobbits set off on their epic quest to Rivendell to pass the ring on to some other suckers, and manage to get lost in an old spooky forest, which is about where I got up to when I was young, and honestly, I'm not surprised I didn't get any further. This place is a labyrinth. Trying to find the hobbits, Frodo comes across horrible spiders that were reasonably okay to take down, and trees that appear and disappear, blocking and unblocking paths as you go along. Well, I think I found out why I got so lost when I was young. I didn't think I'd actually get lost again. The trees just kept bloody blocking the way and confused me completely. Like, even now I had no idea what was going on. I don't understand, what was this tree I was walking into before? I can't even see it anymore. Am I just going insane? Finally having found the three hobbits, they rave on about potatoes of course, before moving deeper into the forest the next day, where, just having woken up, the hobbits immediately start dropping off again. Naturally, they then get eaten by a giant tree. What is it with PS2 games and sentient trees? It's up to Harry, oh, so, sorry, I mean Frodo, to destroy the ancient National Trust protected oak tree. Obviously, the game does a shite job of telling you what to do, and some of the tree's attacks seem a bit unfair. That didn't touch me, that actually didn't touch me, I've got video evidence that it didn't. Hitting the tree's hands enough times eventually makes Tom Bombadil, um who, show up about bloody time. He sings an absolutely awful song. Drink water, go to I would barely even call that singing, to be honest. And the hobbits are finally free. Tom invites them to his house, but only if they collect enough lilies. Uh, why? It's not too difficult, just some more horrid spiders to take down along the way. Also, this is 100% Shrek Swamp, just saying. Yes, I will play Shrek 2 PC games someday, Jesus, shut up. Having collected enough stupid flowers, the hobbits head to Tom's house and meet the lovely Lady Goldberry. Goldberry! The pair of hippies go on about healing crystals and not believing in vaccines or whatever. I don't know, I wasn't really listening. Thank you, Tom Bombadil. And after supper, sends the hobbits on their way once more, reaching the Barry Downs, aka the elephant graveyard from the Lion King. The hobbits take a nap, and the next day, obvs everyone except Frodo has gone missing again. Like, geez, will they ever bloody learn? The Barry Downs were pretty damn spooky, with lots of fog and ghosts that came out of the ground, which I kinda decided to just ignore by simply running away and never stopping. No thanks, not today. Reaching a horrible, dimly lit pit, Frodo finally gets a proper sword, and tries taking down this horrible, vomit zombie thing. Frodo, for some reason, decides that singing solves everything and summons Tom Bombadil, who once more sings away the problem. Babe, this ain't therapy, you can't just talk away all your problems. He then sends them to Bree, where it will actually be safe, and the hobbits stay at the Prancing Pony, where they just get bullied relentlessly. I don't like you hobbits much. Go away. What do you want, fatty? 
Bassy? Frodo meets Aragorn, who looks more like a Loki, Keanu Reeves, John Travolta crossover than Strider. Pippin starts spilling all the beans, so Frodo tries distracting them with his awful singing. Here we go. Before making an even bigger mess by putting the ring on, idiot, a message from Gandalf tells them to leave ASAP, and they realise Merry still hasn't made it back yet. Controlling Aragorn now, it's up to us to find him, and wow is it cool, you don't just have to be useless Frodo the whole time. Aragorn controls similar to Frodo, except he actually has a proper sword, and a bow, and arrows, and he's a tall boy. He also has a few extra moves, like this kick and stab that, uh, to be honest, I was too stupid to use until like near the end of the game. Finding Merry, who went off for some stupid reason, Aragorn takes down some wolves and gets taken down by these two dickheads. Humanoid enemies are definitely tougher to take down, especially when they block. One on one is alright, but any more, and it can be difficult to not take some serious damage. Thank god for all this delicious cram lying about the place, yum yum yum. He also also collects a bunch of random objects to make some decoys that the Black Riders are definitely gonna 100% think are hobbits. Oh, they actually do, idiots. Bree does look pretty nice, if a bit bare. You end up not spending too much time here. It's almost like they had some extra bits planned around here and just never got around to making it. Honestly, this game is kind of giving me unfinished vibes. I'd love to know more about the development and background of this game. In fact, that's why I've invited my friend Alex to tell us more about it. Hey, Alex. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I want to thank Phil for actually allowing me to come on be a part of the Fellowship of the Ring review today. The Fellowship of the Ring game was originally only going to be released on the original Xbox and was going to be developed by a company called WXP. However, later on in development, Vivendi decided that they wanted to also develop the game for the PlayStation 2 and the PC as well. These two ports were developed by a different studio called Surreal Software. My guess is the reason that Vivendi decided to also develop this game on the PlayStation to and the PC as well is because Electronic Arts had the Two Towers game being developed for multiple different systems at that time so that way Vivendi wanted to be able to compete against Electronic Arts here especially as the PS2 was a much bigger platform than the original Xbox. So I'm assuming there's a lot of differences between the versions and cut content? Ah yes Phil, the cut content and all the other random interesting bits and bobs for the different versions of the game. Let's go over it shall we? In order to make sure that Microsoft was still happy with the exclusivity deal of this game, Vivendi decided to make the Xbox port of the game completely different to the PlayStation 2 and PC versions. This is only a rumour, this was never actually confirmed so we don't know this for a fact, but supposedly the PlayStation 2 and the PC version were supposed to have multiple side quests to do throughout the game. The Xbox version of the game, there are actually certain side quests within the Shire, there are some pigs inside one of the guys back garden you need to go and pick up all these pigs and put them inside his pen however we can see elements of that still present as we still have the pigs walking around that person's backyard but the pen and the actual person you talk to are completely missing here there's an entirety of Bree that is completely cut. Most of the people in there are not very friendly and tell him to basically get lost. In a nice way, of course. Fatty! But then when he goes out to check in, he will be attacked by one of these people who will then kidnap him and hold him hostage outside in Bree somewhere. There is an entire stealth section in the game where you as Frodo need to sneak around all these guys that are holding him hostage and escape. Frodo will make his way through the open window, which was next to where Aragorn was standing inside the bar. As soon as Frodo then jumps through the window, you will then get the Pippin part where he's drunk telling everyone about who Frodo is. It's a completely different section. The nice thing about the Xbox port is you are able to at least lock on to your enemies. You can only lock on to one enemy at a time. This is where it can become quite clunky and a bit of a pain. The main reason for this is because if you try to lock on to a target and there are multiple targets around you, you might want to lock on to another target that say has run behind you. They actually included some different arrow types for Aragorn. But there you go, that's just some of the cut or changed content between different ports of the game. So I'm going to hand it back over to Phil. Thanks Alex. Going back to the game, Aragorn takes the hobbits towards Weathertop, and I'm loving the low sun colour scheme and lens flare. Although I love the empty space a bit less to be honest. It's kind of cool that the path isn't super obvious, and there's plenty of wolves on the way up before you reach an old fortress littered with trolls and archers. I wish you had the ability to block arrows, but whatever. <laughs> Um, well we're taking you out first then aren't we? Gonna be an annoying little 
Oh! Making it to the tower, they supposedly find a message from Gandalf. October 3rd was not long ago. But why would he not just write October 3rd when an absolute unit shows up? It's fights like these where a locking feature or dodge button would be quite useful, please. Shooting arrows tends to be an effective way of taking it down, and Frodo spots the Black Riders in the distance, and a trippy cutscene shows Frodo being stabbed to death, or at least I hope so. You then have to defend his rotting corpse from being pecked to death by the remaining Black Riders by setting them on fire. They eventually run off, and we have a mini escort mission. Frodo, now fully zombified, slowly marches on towards Rivendell, to eat all the elves, uh, I assume, and it's up to Aragorn to protect him from the wolves and trolls in his path. Not too tricky. Making it to Rivendell, apparently Frodo has been cured of his affliction, and we have the infamous meeting that introduces the Fellowship. These are leaders of the free peoples of Middle-earth. Right, I didn't ask, but Frodo stupidly volunteers to carry the ring, and everyone else is apparently fine with a child carrying the ring into Mordor. Okay. You then get to chat to everyone in the Fellowship with some bloody awful camera angles and some intense flirting between Aragorn and that hot elf Chick. Heading towards Moria, we now get to control Gandalf, the most interesting of the three playable characters. Oh, with Gandalf. Ooh. As well as a sword, lovingly named Vohammer, Gandalf also has his staff which can be used to cast spells. Gandalf's arsenal contains fireballs, an energy blast that will push back enemies, lightning that can strike and electrocute multiple enemies, and healing. I personally found the lightning spell to be the most useful and fun. Because Gandalf has a healing spell, healing items are a bit less common when playing as the wizard, and instead you collect potions that fill up the spirit bar, which drains when spells are cast. Casting spells can be pretty fun, and this section gives you ample opportunities to try them out with bountiful numbers of wolves and trolls. It also looks pretty good in my opinion, if a bit empty as usual. We finally make it to the entrance, and while the group are trying to work out the password... Do you know the word, Gandalf? If I am allowed a bit of peace, I shall seek for the word. A terrifying sea creature emerges from the dark lake. Aragorn literally just has to fire some arrows for a bit and the problem apparently just goes away though so um okay that was too easy entering the depths of moria we as gandalf must find a safe path through the maze-like passages and pathways which look pretty good not dissimilar to the film's version of moria in fact while i wouldn't go as far as to say the game has copied things from the film there are certainly some things that they quite possibly took inspiration from shall we say however it mostly does a good job of coming up with their own visual ideas for example gandalf looks more pointy and less shabby than ian mckellen's gandalf the Grey, making him feel more powerful, and Aragorn looks um, really ill rather than heroic I guess. The character models definitely vary in their looks, with some looking pretty good. He's got like eyeliner on, and some uh, fugly, just fugly. The graphics range from okay to flat out bad. Like we all know how well the PS2 can do, and unfortunately this is not a game that shows the console's full potential. Interiors look pretty good, with interesting textures, patterns and art, but the outside areas, while having good topological variants with hills and valleys look really quite empty. Lighting is mostly fine, particle effects look okay when they're there, and interestingly, enemies' dead bodies actually remain after death instead of fading away, which is a nice touch. The music is actually pretty good, and instead of the game going for a direct copy of the film's orchestral score, the music here takes a similar but subtly different approach. From what I can tell, the soundtrack uses mostly synthesizer instruments rather than real instruments, giving the whole thing a more eerie, unsettling, mystical approach. Some of it definitely gives me folky, medieval or even <laughs> Enya vibes, and other pieces could have been plucked directly from games like Resident Evil. Sound effects are solid, and the voice acting is pretty good, often very expressive, and not many bad examples actually. Tales of ancient Numenor? Today we must talk about a shadow of the past. We shall miss you terribly, Frodo. Never you mind all that. There are wolves in the Shire. But you are young and I am old. Who are you? Uh, what do you want? I am called Strider. Anyway, getting back to Moria, Gandalf traips around, slaying some enemies, pressing some switches, falling to his death, the usual stuff. Oh. 
Pippin causes a load of racket, which leads to, oh, nothing? No massive army of enemies coming for you like in the films? Alas. You do come across some cave trolls, but you don't even have to take care of them, so um, off we go, solving some weird light puzzle. Is this an underground kingdom of the dwarfs, or is this a school disco? Gandalf finds Farlin's tomb, and finally the giant horde descends, and you take control of Frodo and completely avoid the horde again? Okay. Still, Frodo finally has an actual sword, thank god. We also have this tedious climb up a mile high ladder. This tedious climb down another mile high ladder, which was uh, <laughs> too much for the alert meter apparently. Oh, the, the alert meter has no idea what's going on. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh, you can just take the fast way down, I guess. This ain't no platforming game, I tell ya. I don't wanna play anyway. Opening the big door, we come across the Balrog, and uh, I'm just saying, I wish they did actually try to copy the film a bit here, because what the hell is this ugly monstrosity? And apparently you were dropped straight into the battle with no warning, thanks. It's, um, it's not the best boss battle I've ever come across, I'll be honest with you. The Balrog relentlessly pelts you with fireballs, and the narrow bridge and the awful camera certainly don't help you avoid them. You also can't fire fireballs at the Balrog, as it just makes it stronger, apparently. The way to take on the Balrog is actually to stun it with electricity, run quickly towards the disgusting creature, stab it a couple of times with your sword, quickly run back before it hits you with its own giant sword that kills you in one hit, rinse and repeat. Let's just say that I died a lot. Aragorn also keeps calling you over to give you something important, and it turns out to just be more of that stupid magic cordial. Like, I already have enough Ribena, thanks. Fuck off! God, this was a stupid boss battle. The Balrog fight on the PC version is pretty dull. In the Xbox version, the entire ring area behind where the Balrog would be standing by the bridge normally in the PS2 and PC version is actually an entire fight arena on the Xbox version. You actually walk around that ring area and fight the Balrog in there, where the Balrog is also able to attack you with his sword. And it will also breathe fire, of course, on you too. But this makes the boss fight so much more exciting, and you're actually able able to move around and do so much more, rather than basically just standing still and using a lightning attack and whacking a couple of times. And after all that, Frodo barely cares Gandalf goes down with the Balrog, like put some emotion into it. Gandalf. No! Escaping the mines, you arrive at Lothlorien, and Sam can't help but show his excitement at being surrounded by elves. We get another section like at Rivendell, where Frodo goes around talking to people with bad camera angles. There is no one fairer in any land. Yeah, she's white, we get it, alright. Galadriel shows Sam and Frodo the future, apparently. She has a bit of a meltdown in front of the pair, and then the fellowship sets off once more, when Boromir then has a meltdown in front of Frodo. Guess that's the ring for you. This beautifully coloured level, JMW Turner Who, sees us as Aragorn taking taking on a bunch of orcs, urukai and trolls. Having killed everyone, it suddenly turns to night, and a flying Nazgul snatches Sam. Like, do we care? Bye! This next section of the game is the last section, and also one of the longest, but not in a bad way necessarily. Slowly advancing your way up through the map towards Sam, there's enemies to take care of as usual, and the landscape is pretty nice. Hills and mountains. This level also contains a pretty wacky easter egg. Gollum can be found hidden away in the mountains, and if you find him three times, he insists on giving you presents Literally, what could he give us? That's right, baby. You can use this fish as a sword. Or did I mean a swordfish? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, the fact they actually put this in, plus that cutscene, like the priorities of this game are all over the place. You know what they could have done instead of all of that? Make the game better. Luckily, it also ends up being the most powerful weapon in the game, taking down large trolls in but a few hits. Honestly, this was so funny. Like what an inclusion. Slap him to death. At a certain point, Aragorn holds back the orcs and sends Frodo off to climb to the top, where the Hobbit makes his way up through an old collapsed structure past quite a number of enemies, where I use the ring for probably like the second time in the game. Look, at least we're actually using it. I need to actually use it so I can put it in the video. In no time, we're at the top and then going back to being Aragorn, we have to follow the same path just as we did with Frodo. Uh, okay. We now take on the Nazgul, where the flying creature shoots green fireballs out of its mouth. Getting up close to it though, you can easily just get in hit after hit without the boss making any good attempt at fighting back. It then takes flight, presumably to escape your onslaught, where you can simply shoot it out of the sky with a single arrow. Nice. The final cutscene then plays and 
and um, the credits roll. Using the fish, you are clearly so powerful that the boss doesn't even get time to get up and start flying again. It just dies and the cutscene kicks in. What an ending. Wow. You know, even though this game seemed like a struggle enough to put out, apparently they were pretty far into making a sequel. Alex, care to tell us a bit more about that? It's time to talk about the cancelled game. What better point to start off with than the name of the game? Most people probably don't know this. Lord of the Rings The Treason of Isengard was actually the original name that Tolkien was going to give to the book for the two towers. There was actually quite a fair bit shown for this game, surprisingly. The game was actually almost completed before it was actually scrapped. It was planned to release in 2003, so actually not long after the Fellowship of the Ring game was released. We also know that because Fellowship of the Ring had a really poorly received game engine, Treason of Isengard actually had a complete new game engine from the ground up designed for it, so actually the mechanics of things probably would have been a lot better. Another thing that we know about with this game is that the player was actually meant to be able to play as multiple characters in this game. We were supposed to be able to play as Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, Boromir, which would have been in some flashback scenes, and Sam, but also we would be able to play as two special characters throughout the game, Gollum and also Treebeard. There was also multiplayer implemented into this game. At the time of when they showcased this game, the multiplayer was only split screen, but they did have plans to add in online multiplayer as well. But that's all the information we have about the cancelled game. They decided to cancel the project and move their resources over to making a game about The Hobbit instead. Anyway, I'm going to hand you back over to Phil. Thanks a lot, Alex. See you you later. It's um, it's not the best game I've ever played, I'll say that. A lot of it felt empty, lacking in gameplay, with areas that definitely felt like more was meant to be added in, which in hindsight makes a lot of sense considering its development. The fighting is basic and could definitely do with some quality of life improvements like locking and dodging. Even though a lot of it did feel pretty bare bones, there's something about the presentation that I do find kind of charming. Some of the colours used in the outside sections were really pretty, the voice acting can be pretty good, and the music was actually kind of great. Just a shame the game is so lacking. Having had a quick look at the Xbox version, you can tell that the PS2 version was not the favourite child, shall we say. I'm glad I finally managed to get past the creepy woods, and to be honest, the game matched my pretty low expectations from after that point. While it's not a complete failure of a game by any means, it's definitely far from being polished. A real shame considering the rich world Tolkien built, but seeing as EA didn't seem to be terribly interested, it's great that someone decided to make the first book into a game at all to complete the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. God, I bloody knew I wasn't going mad when that tree just kept being in the way. Like, I mean, <laughs> I was mad, but in a different way. Feel free to subscribe if you like watching me suffer. <laughs> feel free to catch me playing live here and on Twitch. Follow me on my social medias. And if you want, feel free to join the Discord server. It's pretty lit. I also want to say thanks to Alex for helping me out with this video. You should definitely go and check out his video game channel. And we've got something Harry Potter in the works. I'll tell you that. I know how much you lot love Harry Potter games. Ooh. And as always, Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Is this just the book, but with bad graphics? I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Thank you, Tom Bombadil. <laughs> Imagine if we could aim down. Like, how is this useful? Like, do we need a camera? No, just, just guess. What do we love? This game. Game of which year? Every year. Take this. Take Not now. Take what? Thanks a lot for the distraction. I had it had it bloody handled. Thank you, Tom Bombadil. <laughs>